Stanford University. Okay, let's get started. Um, before, before we uh, start the lecture, I'd like to sort of take sort of a very coarse survey and figure out where everyone's uh, skill level is. So if you are an undergraduate, can you uh, let us know? It's fine if you are. We're just uh, wondering. OK. If you are a graduate student, could you let us, us know? All right. OK. If you've got, if you've got a research uh, project that you're working on right now that you'd like to accelerate on a GPU, could you let us know? All right. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> And uh, finally, if you've, uh, if you've ever dereferenced a pointer, could you let us know? OK, that's, <laughs> that's what I wanted to see. I was kind of uh, worried about that coming in. So um, all right, welcome to CS193G. Uh, this is Programming Massively uh, Parallel Process, or, or Introduction to Massively Parallel Computing. Um, so basically, this is the class where you learn how to program uh, GPUs using this uh, programming language called uh, CUDA that's going to run on uh, uh, NVIDIA graphics cards. So basically, we're going to learn how to use gaming cards to uh, do really crazy number crunching for, for science. So let's uh, just quickly go over the, the cor course goals. You know, as I said, we're going to basically, the, the basic goal of the course is to learn what you have to do, how you have to, you know, do the backflips and the gymnastics to get your code to run on uh, graphics processors or, or GPUs. And basically, the number one goal of the course is high performance for these applications. So I think uh, you know, someone once said that if you want to do parallel programming, it's really easy as long as you don't want to run fast. So the, actual, the hard part is figuring out how to you know, parallelize the program and, and map it to the hardware in a way that exposes uh, the inherent parallel, uh, the, the basic inherent parallelism of, of, the, pro of the problem at hand. But almost just as importantly, or, or just as importantly, uh, we want to learn how to basically develop software and code to this kind of strange hardware in a way that is always functional and in a, in a way that the software becomes maintainable. Because, it, I mean, it, do, it doesn't really make much sense to, to, to code up something really fast that runs today, but, you know, six months later when the new graphics card comes out, your code doesn't work anymore. And in fact, uh, the other day, uh, David, uh, my co-lecturer, was telling me how he had, uh, you know, he coded up a, a solution to one of the, uh, the machine problems, or the homework problems. He said, I, I don't understand how the GPU can be this much faster than the CPU. We're getting, you know, 300x speed up over the CPU. And I said, uh, he said, you know, there's, there's one problem. It's, it's not computing the correct answer. And I said, well, you know, David, then you don't actually have that performance. So what's, what's crucially is important is to make sure that the code you're writing is going to be correct and, and maintainable uh, across uh, different kinds of hardware. And something that sort of goes hand in hand with the, the main maintainability aspect is that we want to achieve scalability across future hardware generations. And what that means is that we want to develop our, our parallel software in such a way that uh, you know, we basically write it once, and we have uh, the nice artifact that when we plug in a new GPU six months later that is twice as fast, we want to make sure that the program runs twice as fast and, and scales with the hardware. So that's, that's uh, basically equally as important as uh, high performance. And so what we're going to do in this course is basically give you all the, the technical knowledge uh, uh, that's required to achieve these goals of performance, functionality, and, and scalability. Um, and the way we're going to address that is to basically teach uh, what we think of as principles or, or patterns of, of parallel programming and parallel decomposition of problems. Um, to basically supplement that, we're going to talk a lot about the processor uh, architectural features and performance features of, of the GPUs that uh, basically will allow you to decompose a problem uh, to find its parallelism and map it onto the hardware. And then, you know, finally, to, to, to round it up, we're going to teach you some very practical, a very practical uh, skill set, uh, teach you how to, you know, use the programming API, show you what software tools are available to you, and basically the, the tricks of the trade that's going to allow you to see these massive speed ups that, you know, uh, you're hearing people talk about on, on GPUs. 
So uh, my name is Jared Holbrock. I'm actually from NVIDIA. I, I work on the, the NVIDIA research team. Uh, David Tarjan is my uh, co-lecturer. He's also uh, uh, with the N NVIDIA research team. Uh, you, can, you can contact us with uh, any questions about the course at, at these uh, Gmail addresses. Um, and we'll, we have office hours basically immediately before lecture uh, over in Gates on uh, Tuesdays and uh, Thursdays. Uh, Niels is our course TA, Wave, Niels. Um, and he'll be, he, can, he can handle uh, basically any problems you have with the, the, the course hardware, the, the GPUs that we're going to be using to, to do the programming assignments on. Uh, he can help you with uh, the machine problems that we'll be a assigning to you uh, to, to turn in weekly. And basically, uh, any sort of administrivia or, or CUDA questions, you can direct to Niels. And I don't know if you wanted to say something about uh, office hours. Sure. So uh, there's a lot of people here. Uh, but we're going to make it work by doing lots of office hours. So at this point, I'm going to do office hours Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We offset the Tuesday, Thursday office hours. So you guys will actually have office hours every day of the week. Um, so at this point, that'll be 1 to 2 PM. And I'll post it on the website as well. We'll see how that works, and if I find that I have a lot of people on Fridays and on Mondays or something like that, I might adjust them. But preliminarily, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. Um, and since I'm the only Stanford employee running the course, um, I'll take care of all the admin kind of stuff. So if you guys have issues with login accounts or that kind of stuff, just talk to me. Okay? All right, cool. Um, and to sort of round out the class, uh, we're going to be have we're going to invite some guest lecturers uh, from NVIDIA to basically give half of the lectures. Uh, these are going to be uh, domain experts that are going to talk about things like uh, case studies of parallel decomposition onto, onto the GPU. Uh, they'll give you things like performance tricks and uh, how to, you know, the, the, the strange little programming practices that uh, you might want to try if you want to get you know, peak performance on your, on your algorithm. And, um, also, some, some lectures that, that look forward to what we think the, you know, the future of parallel programming is going to look like, maybe five years down the road. So just some, uh, some more administrivia. Uh, so much of the class is actually on the web. So we've set up a, a Google code site to uh, host all of the, uh, the code and lecture slides for the class. So like, as I said, we'll be posting the, the lecture slides there before class so you can, you know, you can follow along on your laptop. Um, some of the code examples that we're going to throw up on the slides will probably look pretty small on the projector. So, you know, if you want to bring your laptop and follow around, that might, that might uh, help out. Um, we'll also be putting recordings of the lectures on that site. Uh, I don't know how soon the recordings will show up there. It might actually show up there after the class, but, uh, I mean, they'll be there for posterity, uh, I guess. And uh, we'll, we'll try to make a, an effort to post any sort of uh, announcements about course schedule or, or things that might pop up uh, in class. But do, do plan to attend lecture because uh, I believe the course is not being uh, streamed uh, live. So you know, if you want to get the info, you need to, to, to be in class. We've also set up a, a mailing list that you can find linked off of the course. And we'd actually prefer you to direct any sort of technical questions to the mailing list because um, you know, if you have a question about how to program in CUDA or why isn't my GPU working or uh, why is my computer on fire right now, other, other students in the class might actually have that same concern. So you'll want to send it to the, to the mailing list uh, rather than to one of us uh, three personally. And uh, finally, we'll use the uh, access for grades. So about grading, this is a, a, a lab-oriented course, so there, there will be no exam. Uh, just a lot of uh, programming assignments. Um, and so we're going to divide up the credit for the course between half of what we're calling uh, machine problems, or basically programming assignments, and then half is going to be uh, a quarter project, uh, so, so sort of a, a sort of a large development effort uh, that you'll do uh, to round out the last half of the class. Um, and, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we want to uh, emphasize correctness of our parallel codes, so we're going to put, you know, 40%-ish of each uh, credit is going to be thrown at, at correctness. So you'll actually have to produce the correct output to get, uh, to get your credit. And then uh, since we also want to emphasize performance, we'll also have a, a performance uh, a part of the grade as well. And then finally, um, you know, I said we say report uh, up on here, but we'll, really what that means is we'll, we'll just ask a few targeted questions about the homework assignment uh, to make sure you basically understand uh, what you coded up.
Niels. Hey, Jared, can I still get performance points if my answer is wrong? It's a good question, Niels. <laughs> <laughs> so as I mentioned uh, in our experiment the other day, David thought he was going to get performance points for a 300x speed up over the, the CPU, but it turned out that uh, Dave, David was wrong and his program was not correct, so he, he received zero, zero points and failed, failed that assignment. So please, please write, p please write correct programs, and we will make it easy for you to, to validate that your program is correct. Uh, we'll have a sort of a gold standard that we'll send out uh, with each uh, programming assignment or a machine problem that will make it easy for you to, to validate that you're actually computing something uh, sane. And then finally, the, the second half of the course credit will be a project. And it looks like many of you are graduate students that have something in mind already that they'd like to uh, you know, accelerate on the GPU. So the, the intent of the project is to simply let you all do what you know, you're, you're intending to do anyway, and that is uh, work towards your, your research uh, project and, and find a way to you know, parallelize that uh, using CUDA. And so basically what this will entail is that uh, we'll, we'll allocate one, uh, one class lecture to basically project pitches. We'll ask all of you to basically tell us shortly what you're planning on doing just so we can sort of gauge whether this is, is feasible enough. And then um, we'll have some sort of presentation and demo towards the, the, the end of the class, probably on the last lecture. Uh, we'll try to do something like a, a poster session or, or something like that. Uh, one thing we'll be doing in this class is giving you basically free days or, or bonus days to, to use for late days for uh, your uh, machine problems. So, so basically the idea here is to, we're giving you two days that you can use, no questions asked, to, to submit a late uh, homework problem. Um, and you can use them both on the, on the same machine problem if you want. Uh, and in fact, you can, you can min-max it if you want to and use this on a... On a um, on a, on a weekend, so we're not actually going to count Friday through Monday as three days. It'll just be one bonus day, so you can, um, you know, basically spend the weekend working on your uh, your homework pro project if you want to. And so the idea here is to just, uh, you know, cover if you get sick or if you have an interview visit, or if you just need more time, or you know, if you'd rather spend Friday at the nut house, that's that's fine. Uh, just use a bonus day. And then after that, um, the late penalty is going to be. Uh, 10% of the possible credit per day. But, you know, the, the machine problems shouldn't be too difficult. Um, worst case, I think they'll probably take three to four hours to, to finish each one, and they'll be assigned weekly. Um, I guess I have to say this, please don't cheat. I've written it in red, so you know that it's important. Um, so we want to encourage you to, to, uh, to discuss the programming assignments with your peers. Uh, I always find that I get smarter when I talk to smarter people. So please find someone smarter than yourself and, and ask them uh, about the, the homework assignment. Um, just don't share code. So don't, don't, um, don't no copy pasta, please. D don't copy it and, and paste any, any code lines. So, um, and this would include you know, going off and reading your, your friend's uh, uh, assignment and then coding it up yourself. So the actual GPUs or the course equipment we're going to use for this class it includes whatever GPUs you might have lying around. So that, that would include um, you know, any GPUs that you might have in your, in your laptop or in your desktop at home. But, but we've also uh, allocated uh, several of the, the machines in the, in the basement of Gates uh, and, put, and put GPUs in them. So these are uh, called GeForce GTX 260 boards. Uh, they're CUDA programmable. Um, they should be very decent uh, development uh, GPUs. Um, I no we noted here that nodes 2, 8, 11, 12, and 13 for sure have GPUs in them, but Niels tells me that actually 10 of those machines... Yeah, it's actually 2 through 8. 2 through 8, okay. <laughs> Is there any... Uh, do, you, do you know if, if it's clear just from looking at the machine whether it has a <laughs> GPU in it? Um, no, no. It's, well, I mean, you can always keep on the back, and it's pretty obvious that one has a lot of extra bits. <laughs> okay, um, maybe, maybe we can, we'll try to get a list, a proper list of which machines have CUDA cards in them and, and put them on the, the course website. Um, and I guess you can also log into these remotely, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. so that's the, uh, what we recommend is the way to use them, is to just SSH into them uh, and code remotely, but these are actual desktops in the basement of Gates. So if you like sitting in front of the computer with a graphics card on it, um, then you can do that too. Um, CUDA is a little finicky on these machines in that 
if you're sitting at the machine and you're running an X session, if any CUDA kernel takes longer than five seconds, the machine will crash. Um, now that's not too bad because most CUDA, like 99.9% .9 of CUDA kernels doesn't take more than five seconds. Um, so you're usually fine. Um, but if you have a bug in your code and it freezes the card, then it might kick you out of X. Um, but it's not the worst thing in the world. So that's why we say, hey, it's easier to work remotely because it doesn't have these issues. Um, also, I guess one thing to note is that the CUDA driver um, doesn't do any kind of scheduling of kernels or anything. So if four people on the same card tries to run the same program at the same time, um, the behavior is undefined. Uh, <laughs> uh, also, usually not a case because kernels run fast and they take a second or two. Um, but if you get, if you think everything's working fine and then suddenly everything breaks, it's might be worth waiting a minute or two or maybe logging into a different machine and seeing if it's just because someone else is using the graphics card at that point in time. Um, so I don't want to harp on about this too much, but CUDA on these cards as a kind of shared teaching environment um, sometimes has some glitches. Uh, we're aware of it. We monitor these things. We have a bunch of cron jobs constantly cleaning them up in the background every five minutes. Um, so if something seems terribly wrong, wait five minutes and try again. Uh, and email me because we'd like to know what you run into. But uh, after I think after last quarter we ironed out most of the wrinkles, so we should be fine. Great. So that's what that's what we call in the in the, in the industry fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So thank you for fudding CUDA for us, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so if if I don't know if you if you follow the industry at all or follow PC gaming, uh, you might have uh, become familiar with this uh, new GPU architecture that NVIDIA has introduced uh, basically this past weekend uh, called Fermi. Um, and we this is it's actually interesting because these new these this new uh, architecture these cards will become uh, available over the course of the class. So one thing we'd like to do is uh, try to get them in, into these. Uh, into these uh, the, the pups cluster, so you can play around with the new features of the uh, the newer architecture, and we'll let you know uh, if we're able to to both get those cards and make them available to you all. So uh, the course textbook um, is this this book by Kirk and, and Hu called "Programming Massively Parallel Processors: A Hands-On Approach." So this book just came out uh, within the past couple months, and is actually uh, a book they wrote. Uh, after they basically built this class from the ground up that we've you know, based this class off of. So the class is basically going to follow the, the, the first several chapters of this textbook very, uh, very closely. Um, so that you, you might find that to be a good, uh, a good resource. And then, of course, other references uh, just for CUDA programming are, are going to be the CUDA programming guide and, and reference manual, which you can find on the, the NVIDIA website. And again, we'll be, we'll be posting lectures uh, to the to the course website, uh, basically as we give them. So let me give you a, a quick rundown of the schedule for the the course. Um, this week is basically just an introduction and a motivation for uh, massively parallel programming and an introduction to CUDA to CUDA programming. So next time David will talk a little bit about what it actually looks like to write uh, CUDA kernels in in the language. Um, towards the end of the lecture, I'm going to uh, assign MP0, which is basically hello world. Uh, this won't be for credit. It's basically just to uh, make sure as a sanity test that your development environment works and that you're able to, to use the, the, the tools and the compiler and to, to build uh, very simple kernels. And then at the end of this week, we'll assign MP1, which is basically uh, how to parallelize a for loop and uh, basically variations on parallel for. So next week, we'll, we'll talk a lot about uh, CUDA threads and atomic operations, and uh, also the, CU the CUDA memory model, um, and also assign MP2, which will be basically about uh, how to use atomic operations in, uh, in kernels. We'll de define exactly what we mean by uh, atomic operation. It's, it's uh, not radioactive. It means something different. Uh, week three, uh, we'll talk about uh, programming for uh, performance a little bit, uh, and then also uh, Basically, what we think of as computational thinking or, or how to decompose your problems such that they map to uh, parallel architectures. Uh, week four, we'll start thinking about the projects and we'll have you come in and basically pitch your problem idea for a lecture. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll, 
introduced the idea of parallel patterns. And these are basically patterns that just keep popping up in, in parallel programming uh, that you can use to help map your, your, uh, your, your problem to uh, you know, basically a, a parallel solution. And then the, the final uh, machine problem that we'll uh, assign that week is basically on uh, productivity. And we'll talk about how to use uh, higher level libraries to basically build really non-trivial apps uh, uh, that also run at, uh, with uh, high, high performance, but also uh, enable high productivity uh, as a programmer. And so the, the second half of the class is going to be these invited talks from um, some experts from NVIDIA. So uh, in week five, we'll, we'll have uh, invited guests talk about uh, basically pro productive parallel programming and, and, and sparse matrix vector operations. Uh, after that, we'll have uh, a guest lecturer speak about uh, PDE solvers and uh, the new Fermi architecture. Um, in week seven, we'll talk about, uh, basically have a ray tracing case study uh, and talk about what it takes to, to do this, uh, to map this uh, kind of strange uh, graphics algorithm called ray tracing to uh, basically rasterization hardware. And uh, to round out that week, uh, we'll have someone come in to talk about the, what the future of throughput uh, programming uh, we think will look like. Uh, we'll have some people talk about uh, artificial intelligence on, on, the, on the GPU and how to uh, parallelize apps with uh, thousands of uh, you know, intelligent agents. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll go even, uh, even more in depth into very advanced optimization uh, and basically tricks of the trade for uh, optimizing CUDA. Uh, we'll figure something out for week nine. Uh, it's to be determined. And then uh, we'll round out the class with uh, project presentations uh, for the, the course project. All right, so let's get started with uh, basically the motivation for this class. So who's, who knows, this, who, who knows Mer uh, Moore's Law? I assume lots of people are probably familiar with this idea. So I think this, this gives, basically predicts or explains what we're all doing here. So just in case you don't know, Gordon Moore was the co-founder of Intel. And back in the 60s, he sort of noticed that, hey, you know, every, every two years, we're able to put twice as many transistors on the same uh, area of semiconductor. This is kind of weird. You know, we can, we can shr keep shrinking these transistors and doubling, basically, the, the density of transistors in a, in a CPU. And this is probably going to keep continuing uh, without bound for as far as we can see. And you can actually visualize Moore's law in a graph. So if you look down in the, the lower left-hand corner of this graph, you see this, this basically the first Intel chip, the, the 4004 uh, in, in you know, 1970 with around 1,000 transistors on it. And so if you plot this, this graph of transistors per CPU or per processor over time and put it on a log scale, you see it's actually linear. So basically, Gordon Moore was correct. You can actually double the the density of transistors on your die uh, every couple of years. And you can see that uh, you know, it follows through uh, from the, the Pentium in the, in the 90s up to uh, uh, GPUs such as the, the GF100 uh, uh, up in the very top uh, corner of the, of the graph. But you also note that uh, different market demands actually produce uh, aberrations in the graph. So for example, you see this, this outlier on the right here, which is uh, Intel's Atom processor. So Atom's kind of an interesting processor because uh, here what the, the actual market demands for this processor implied that they really wanted really low power. And so instead of um, packing more and more transistors onto the same die, they made a different compromise and uh, you, know, you get this uh, aberration in the curve. But when, when, you know, when the consumer is willing to spend uh, 400 to 500 dollars on, on a CPU or a GPU every year, you know, you can stay on this nice uh, Moore's Law curve. So, unfortunately, uh, Moore didn't predict anything about power when he, when he uh, uh, you know, declared his law. So what, the, what we're graphing here, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, the, the names show up, but they're not, they're not so uh, important. Uh, what, we're, what we're graphing here is basically the power demands of a, of a processor versus the performance on the x-axis. So basically, lower on this graph is better. You want your, the power demands of your processor to be as low as possible, but you want it to be as performant as possible. Uh, but, but the problem is uh, this ratio isn't constant. It actually grows over time. So you know, back in the, back in the, uh, the early 90s with the uh, early mass market uh, Intel chips like the, the 386, 
in the lower left hand corner, you've got this nice sweet spot where you have low power demands, but the, the performance is actually pretty decent, or the, the power to performance ratio is decent. But over time, as you keep packing uh, transistors onto the chip uh, following Moore's law, your power demands grow quite large and, until you get up here in the upper right hand corner of the graph with uh, basically the last single core uh, CPU, uh, which was the, uh, the Intel Pentium 4 up there with a pretty uh, high power to performance ratio. So the upshot of the graph basically says that you can buy performance with power, uh, but the, the ratio isn't linear. And so we've actually send, seen a trend of decreasing gains over the year as, as uh, processors get hotter and hotter. And in fact, uh, you know, we were talking about this at lunch. This is sort of a problem with the industry at large, not just with uh, processors. So if you, if you follow like PC gaming sites, or uh, GPU sites, you'll see people, you know, posting pictures of their tricked out rigs, right? They've got the, the sweet power supply with the, the water cooler on it and the, and, you know, the awesome neon lights. Uh, that all looks very impressive, but it's all there because they have to keep that GPU as cold as possible so that it doesn't, uh, you know, throw errors while uh, the game is being played. And that's on a very fine scale. Um, on the, on the, the larger scale, you look at what Google has to do to, uh, to deal with its power demands. And so the you know, Google is this large company that has to, you know, put these uh, data centers across, across the company to house these, you know, giant racks of uh, basically servers that live somewhere in the cloud. And these, these uh, data rooms get very, very hot. And so what Google has to do to trick out its power supply is basically have the, the high, high intensity uh, uh, wires coming into the building and they have to put the building by the river so they can divert the river into the building and, and you know, to cool, out, to cool off the... Uh, the data center. So this, this problem of, of power is, is basically industry-wide and it's basically uh, turning the way that we engineer and architect these chips uh, basically on its head. So uh, what, we, what we have to realize is that uh, basically serial performance scaling is over because that last graph said that if we want to make our chips faster and faster, we basically have to make them hotter and hotter and uh, uh, feed them more and more power. Uh, but in fact, if you go to Best Buy, you'll note that you don't see any uh, processors that advertise that they're a, a clock speed of 10 gigahertz. That just doesn't happen anymore. You don't, you don't really put clock speed on, on the box anymore. You put number of cores because we can't actually make uh, serial processors uh, any faster. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, we can't in continue to increase the, the power consumption simply because if we did so, that would melt the chip. And the, the consumer gets very unhappy when you, when you melt their chip. And it turns out to be very expensive for the, the chip vendor. Um, so what can we do? Well, uh, Moore's law is still in effect, right? So we can still continue to pack more and more transistors onto the die. Uh, but we can't make those individual transistors any faster. So um, basically, what that means is that uh, we have to look for new ways to use those transistors. Basically, if we can't make them any faster, is there any sort of smarter way to build the hardware such that we can continue to increase performance, um, if not by brute forcing it through making the clock speed that much faster? So people look for a lot of ways to try to do this. And uh, basically, in the, you know, in the late 90s, towards the end of the, the single core CPU uh, chip epoch, uh, people and in, in computer architects were looking at things like instruction level parallelism. So the idea here is that you design a kind of a complicated uh, both architecture and compiler that can basically figure out how to schedule uh, an instruction stream in, in, a, in a way that it can be done out of order, but in a way that can uh, increase instruction throughput. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, as we saw, there's vanishing opportunities to do this uh, when you're power constrained, because this requires you know, complicated logic on the, on the die for handling th this out of order processing. And it, in, involves, uh, you know, complicated uh, compilers that may or may not be able to take advantage of instruction level parallelism. So instead, uh, what people tried to do later was uh, this idea of data level parallelism. So here the idea is, well, instead of making the, you know, the, the chips scale faster, what if we can add instructions that do more all at once? And so here you see basically this proliferation of, of things like uh, vector units, uh, SIMD units and um, new instruction sets. So example, uh, 
Intel introduced this instruction set called SSE that basically uh, operates on more than one data element at a time. Um, so instead of you know, increasing the, the speed that we can execute individual instructions, we just make each individual construction or instruction uh, do more at once. And this idea shows up in a lot of different places, such as you know, the, the, the cell uh, architecture and clear speed. And it's also the same idea is also used in, in GPUs. So another, another way that you can use all these new transistors at your disposal is to uh, go after what's called thread level parallelism. So the idea here is that uh, instead of making a single core that runs as fast as possible, make lots of simple, uh, s uh, simple cores all on the same CPU or, or GPU die. Maybe each one of them runs a little bit slower than a single core uh, CPU would, but you stick several of them all down on the, on the same piece of silicon and allow them to work together. And this is basically uh, the idea behind uh, architectures like the GPU. And this shows up in, in other places as well, such as you know, uh, uh, Intel chips are now all multi-core. So if you go to Best Buy and buy a laptop, it's going to have more than one core in the, in the CPU. Uh, AMD has tried this. Sun has tried this. Again, uh, Cell uh, and NVIDIA does this in their, in their GPUs. And so um, you know, this thread level parallelism idea has been pretty successful. In fact, we can graph uh, how successful it's been uh, uh, over the years. So on this slide, what we're graphing is basically uh, performance, so basically teraflops, that's trillions of floating point operations per second um, over time. And we've got two uh, basically trends here. Uh, in blue, we've got Intel CPUs. And in green, we've got NVIDIA GPUs. And you can see at the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the, of, the, of the graph, they started out fairly comparable, right? But as NVIDIA aggressively pursued this, this strategy of thread-level parallelism, you see that the, the graph uh, cuts away quite, quite quickly. And in fact, you know, in 2010, we see this huge performance gap between uh, the, the most performant NVIDIA GPUs and uh, th this future uh, Intel CPU Westmere. And in <coughs> fact, that, that the gap that we're seeing here is on the order of hundreds of, giga, uh, hundreds of gigaflops. So I think uh, this, this data point in the top right on the, uh, the NVIDIA GPU is, is at maybe 1.2 teraflops. Uh, and uh, Westmere is down here at, uh, looks like, 200 gigaflops. So in fact, there's this, this, this huge potential buildup between these, these, two, uh, these two graphs. So if you think of, like, think of some sort of um, you know, electrical potential between the, the two graphs, at some point that gap is going to become so high that the, you know, the pain involved in porting your serial code to the GPU is, not, is, is going to be small compared to the actual performance benefit that you're going to enjoy if you, if you actually go through the, the, the process of uh, porting your application to run in parallel. And in fact, that's what we're seeing uh, a lot of people doing uh, today. Just because that gap is so huge, the, the performance benefit uh, makes the porting process uh, worth it. And so a related graph that we can also look at is bandwidth. And this is basically a measure of how fast the, the processor, the CPU or the GPU, can read data and write data from memory. And so actually higher is, is, a lot, is, is better than, than lower here. And the graphs are similar, um, the, with the gap being somewhere, at, somewhere uh, along the, on the order of, of 10x. So in fact, GPU architectures are designed to have much higher uh, bandwidth uh, capabilities than, than our CPU architecture. And these, these demands are basically driven by um, well, PC games, just because the application uh, demands uh, much higher uh, bandwidth. So the upshot of these curves is that, well, the, the Moore's law is still in effect, but we just have a slightly new derivation of it. Um, so what you should take away from these, these slides is that computers are not actually getting faster every year. They're just getting wider and more parallel. We're just packing more and more cores onto the same die. And what this means for you all is that if you want to write your programs in a way such that, such that they get faster when you plunk down you know, that $1,000 for a, a new PC, you need to write them in a way uh, such that they expose parallelism. Um, because you know, s single core uh, programs aren't going to get any faster because single cores aren't getting any faster. 
And you know, we think that what we call data parallel computing is the most uh, scalable approach to solving this problem. Um, and to just give you an example, consider, consider that, uh, let's say you, you buy a new laptop that has two cores in it and you've got a, a problem such as maybe some sort of linear algebra problem that you want to solve on, solve on it. And so to take advantage of those two cores, you need to find two things going on in your program that, that are independent that can happen in parallel. So maybe you, you take one of those cores and uh, you, make it, you put it in charge of uh, I.O. operations. And then you take the other core and, and uh, put it in charge of actually doing some sort of dense matrix calculation. But you know, what's going to happen to that uh, code when uh, next year you buy your new laptop and it has four cores in it? You're going to have to refactor your code and, and find more parallelism somewhere in that application. Um, so maybe you, know, maybe you put mouse and keyboard on, on your next two cores or something like that. But you know, what happens next time when you get your, your new machine with eight cores, you're going to have to keep revisiting this problem um, over and over again. And so it's just not a scalable solution. So basically the argument is that, well, your, your problem is always going to have more data than you do cores in your processor. So you should organize your computation, your computation around the actual data or the problem that you want to solve instead of the actual hardware that you have to solve the problem. So instead of what, thinking about how many cores your processor has, think about how many, for example, elements you're, are, are in your problem. And so one instance of this data parallel idea is uh, basically a, a generic multi-core chip. So up here on the, on, on the projector, I've got uh, basically a straw man uh, or an idealized uh, CPU that you, know, you might find in your laptop. And so the idea of an architecture like this is that you've got a handful of processors. So if you've got a dual core machine, you've got two of these cores. And they each run maybe one or two threads on each core. And so attached to these processors is this, uh, this memory that each of these threads has access to. And uh, this, chip, this, this memory is, is, is on chip, and maybe it comes in the form of a cache. And then uh, these processors can talk to each other through a, a global memory space that sits somewhere out uh, in external DRAM. So uh, this is basically the, you know, the very, very coarse grain uh, diagram of what's going on in, in your, your laptop's uh, processor. And so you can take a, a design like this, tweak it a little bit, and you end up uh, with what we call a, a many-core chip or a many-core processor. So the idea is roughly the same. You've got uh, processors, each with a little bit of fast uh, on-chip memory, which are connected uh, to each other across uh, a, a global memory space. But it's a little different. In each of these processors, instead of one or two chips, you've actually got lots and lots of threads. And what that means is that per thread, uh, each thread has access to uh, basically less memory than did the, uh, the multi-core chip, since there's more of them. And again, the, uh, instead of one or two of these cores, you actually have maybe dozens of them, like you would find on a, uh, on a GPU. And again, they're, they're able to, to talk to each other and communicate through uh, this, this shared uh, global memory that sits off in, in a DRAM. And in fact, this is how GPUs are, are architected these days. Um, in, in, in fact, uh, GPUs are these basically mass market commodity products, and uh, we sell them at these really big economies of scale. Um, so if, for instance, at one point, I think NVIDIA was selling around 1 million uh, GPUs per week. Um, and what this means is that we can make basically you know, supercomputing available to a, a wider audience. You know, back in the, the, the good old days of supercomputing, this was kind of a niche idea that was only available to you know, the very elite, those at national labs or at these huge supercomputing centers. Uh, but you know, basically, the, the popularity of video games and the, the consumer demand for, for parallelism has you know, allowed uh, GPU vendors to bring these uh, basically supercomputing ideas to a, a broader audience and you know, allowed you all to uh, have a reason to become you know, interested in, in, in parallel uh, computing. So the upshot is that you know, basically massively parallel computing or supercomputing is now a commodity technology and uh, you know, we, can all, we can all program to it. 
So I'll g give just a little historical basis for uh, the evolution of the, the GPU architecture. Um, so we've got one data point up here, which is the, uh, the G GeForce GTX 280. So this is a chip uh, similar to the one that you'll all be uh, programming in the, uh, for your uh, homework assignments. So basically, this chip can achieve roughly uh, one terif teraflop of uh, peak performance. And it also has a high bandwidth memory. So um, this chip, I guess, has 140 uh, gigabytes per second of bandwidth to uh, you know, this external global memory space. And um, you know, since these, these chips are very popular for playing video games, uh, we sell a lot of them. And there's a lot of GPUs out there in the wild. Uh, which means that there's potentially a broad audience for actually executing the programs and, and the projects that you work on uh, in, this, in this class. And you can kind of see the, the progression of Moore's Law as it applies to GPUs uh, in, in the bottom of the slide here. You know, back in 1995, the, the state of the art in, in, in GPUs was basically 3 million transistors, uh, but you, you, know, you got a very uh, unimpressive result on the screen. Um, but by Around the 2003 time frame, you, you see that we're already up to 125 million transistors in a, in a gaming chip. Uh, and by that time, GPUs have become uh, generally programmable, which meant that you, know, you can draw pictures of, of, of fairies and, and bald guys, I guess. And then, uh, <laughs> it looks very nice, though. Um, and then finally, uh, this, this, this chip Fermi here on the, on the end here, which is this chip that we've just recently introduced, uh, boasts, uh, I think, 3 billion transistors and, you know, is capable of, of uh, generating these very beautiful photorealistic images. So clearly, uh, you know, data parallelism is a very powerful idea if you've got uh, the right problem uh, to solve with it. And, and graphics has proved to be one of, uh, uh, one of those problems. So we can, look at the, we can take a look at the lessons that uh, GPU architects have learned from uh, the graphics uh, pipeline. And the first of those is that throughput is, is paramount, is basically the most important thing that you care about. Um, and here, when we say throughput, we mean basically the effective work that the processor is doing per, per unit time. So you can think of this as flops or uh, operations per second. Um, and so what graphics demands is that you know, if you want to build an impressive game, you have to paint every pixel within some specified time frame. Say every 60 times a second, you have to paint, say, a million pixels. All right, that's a lot of fr uh, throughput uh, and bandwidth that, that problem requires. And um, I guess the second, the second uh, lesson that we've learned is that um, it's good to have a scalable problem. And graphics is one of these problems, right? Uh, it's, it's very convenient for uh, GPU vendors that, that game programmers are able to write their game in a way that is sort of hardware agnostic. So if I'm a gamer, I can buy you know, uh, some GPU uh, this year and, and run, this, run some game. And then next year, I can just swap in a new GPU and, and run that game twice as fast, hopefully. And that's because the problem is scalable. Um, so painting all these pixels in, in this, this uh, very rigid time budget requires that we have to run and retire lots and lots of threads very rapidly. Um, and at, at one point, uh, just to give you an idea of how fast we can create and swap out these threads, uh, we were actually able to, to measure around 15 billion threads uh, per second uh, created, uh, executed, and retired. So we're, you know, the, the level of parallelism that we're talking about in a gaming application is, is uh, really staggering. Um, and then finally, a, a final lesson that we learned is that we should use multi-threading to hide latency. And so what multi-threading means is that uh, we've got this very parallel chip, uh, but we have a problem that is sort of larger than the scale of parallelism. So for example, if my chip has, say, um, 240 uh, processor threads on it, but my problem is on the scale of a million, we can use uh, multi-threading multi to map those millions of uh, problems across uh, those 250 or so uh, threads. And we can do that to hide uh, latency, or basically the round trip time that it takes to, to memory. So you might be wondering, how is this any different from what uh, a CPU architect would do? Well, the, 
the answer is basically that the, 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 the two processors have different goals in mind. So when the architects sit down to design uh, either a CPU or a GPU, they have different things in mind. So on a, on a GPU, we basically assume that the problem is, is highly parallel as we do with, with graphics. In fact, we often call graphics an embarrassingly parallel problem, um, basically because the tasks are, are totally independent and uh, can, be, can be run completely independent of each other. But on the other hand, a CPU architect sits down and says, I have to design the CPU such that it can solve any problem, no matter what the user, what the user throws at it. And in fact, these, these present very different uh, design requirements. So what the CPU wants to do is minimize latency, or the time it takes to do some sort of operation that a single thread experiences. And so what the CPU architect is going to do is, is, uh, is to design a big on-chip cache to deal with latency to, to external memory. And to deal with that cache, he's going to have to design in a lot of complicated control logic to make sure that you know, the, the cache is coherent and, and things look sane when you look at memory. But on the other hand, you know, the, the GPU architect doesn't care about any of that. All he cares about is maximizing the throughput of, say, millions of threads. So uh, to, to basically achieve that goal, uh, we're going to do away with things like caches because we don't need them. Instead, we can use multi-threading to hide uh, latency to memory. And in fact, what, what, uh, you know, what a GPU architect will do is, uh, as, you know, as I said, use multi-threading to hide latency and uh, do things like amortize control logic across large groups of threads. So in fact, the, the design requirements are, are, are quite different for the, the two processors. So we can take a high level look at uh, basically what a, a GPU looks like. Um, basically, you see this large sea of, of these green scalar cores. And you can think of these basically as, as threads or, or little processors. And these are connected to each other uh, by this, this uh, blue uh, L2 cache uh, that sits out uh, uh, and, and connects them all uh, together. And, in, and of course, on the, on the side, you've got some uh, fixed function uh, logic to support uh, special graphics operations that uh, have to be very fast uh, uh, for video games. But if we zoom in on, on a piece of the architecture, we find what we call the SM uh, processor. And SM stands for Streaming Multiprocessor. So basically what we do here is group uh, these, these green scalar cores together um, into a, basically a single unit. And that unit is going to share things. And this makes it actually cheaper to design. So for example, it's going to share things like a, a small on-chip uh, uh, memory, or you can sort of think of it as a cache. Uh, and it's going to share things like control logic. And what the basically interesting, uh, or the high bit point from this, this slide is that this is a lot different uh, from what a, a CPU architect would do. You know, instead, they, he wouldn't replicate out all those, those uh, cores across a, a single um, core. In fact, he'd only care about the throughput of, a, of one of those cores. And instead of devoting a lot of area to, to logic to support uh, these, these little green scalar cores, he'd probably spend that on, on a cache, right? Because he wants to minimize the latency that a single thread experiences. And so the, the basic ideas uh, behind the SM uh, are something that we call SIMT. And that stands for Single Instruction Multiple Thread Execution. And so the idea here is that we're going to divvy up these, these green cores and put them together into groups that we, that we call warps. And so warp is a term that comes from looming. It's actually, uh, I think, a, a series of parallel threads that come together. So that's where the, that's where the, the name comes from. But the idea here is that a warp is going to share resources. And some of those resources include uh, uh, something like program counter. So what's going to happen is that uh, when, you've, when you're executing threads on this, this, uh, this machine, uh, all the threads in a warp are going to be sharing things like what, pro what, what uh, instruction they're, they're operating on at once. Um, but the hardware is automatically going to handle it if those threads decide to diverge and do different things. And so this is, this is basically where CUDA comes in. So CUDA is this uh, basically scalable parallel uh, programming model uh, that we used to program uh, you know, NVIDIA GPUs. 
And so the idea is to make it as simple as possible for a new programmer to approach. And in fact, it's just a minimal set of extensions to uh, C or, or C++. But a big idea is that uh, CUDA is a heterogeneous uh, serial parallel computing model. So in fact, uh, you know, CUDA is going to ask the, the processor to basically uh, partition the problem into parts of the, the program that can run on the serial uh, processor or the CPU and pro parts of the program which are parallel, which are going to get mapped onto uh, the parallel GPU resources. Um, and, you know, GPUs accelerate this model enormously, uh, but um, you, can, you can also map it to other processors such as uh, CPUs. And just for a little motivation for uh, basically why, why it might be a good idea to learn CUDA, uh, just go quickly through some uh, results that we've seen from some external folks. So uh, first we've got this um, basically electromagnetic propagation from cell phones. Uh, you know, people want to figure out if uh, cell phones cause cancer, so they, you know, they simulate what happens when radio waves go through the brain. And uh, these researchers actually achieved a 45 times speed up over the, the CPU. Uh, moving on, we see some uh, fluid simulations that are, uh, I think, running in MATLAB, or a MATLAB that's been GPU accelerated. Uh, they, they saw a 17x speed up. Here we've got uh, an in-body uh, uh, astrophysical uh, calculation. Um, this is actually a very, very parallel problem, and uh, some researchers were able to achieve a 100x speed up over a, a serial or CPU program. Uh, here we've got, uh, I think, a bioinformatics uh, application that saw 35x speed up. Um, next we have, a, I guess, a, a molecular dynamics application. Um, they saw a speed up anywhere from 110 to 240 times speed up over the, the CPU. Um, molecular dynamics maps very nicely to the, the, the GPU. And finally, we've got this uh, results for, uh, I guess, MRI processing. So the, the story here is that, uh, you know, you can do MRI processing on, on CPUs uh, today, uh, but the problem is that uh, you can't really do it in a clinical setting because it, it takes so long. It could take uh, maybe hours to, to denoise this data that we're seeing on the, the right here. But in fact, if you parallelize it, you can actually make it interactive uh, uh, with CUDA, and you can actually get a, a result uh, with the patient in the, in the, the, you know, the clinic um, while he waits. So I just want to give a really quick introduction to what a, a CUDA program uh, might look like uh, before we end up here. So the idea is the, with CUDA is to basically take C or C++ and then augment it with a really minimal set of extensions. So basically we're going to introduce little keywords and idioms into the language that make uh, mapping to the GPU a little bit easier. Um, and as I said, it's a great fit for the GPU architecture, but in fact it, uh, it maps well to multi-core CPUs uh, as well. Um, but the central idea, I guess, behind CUDA is to make it possible to scale the same program to hundreds to ten thousands of, of, of parallel threads. So each of these threads is very lightweight. Uh, as I said before, uh, creating and instantiating these threads is basically free. And you, know, you can contrast that to a, a thread that you might uh, create on the CPU, which comes with a pretty big uh, a penalty. And then, in fact, the GPU is actually designed to, to need the scale of parallelism to be, uh, to be fully utilized. I mean, if you look back at the, the, the diagram I showed you, we literally have this really huge sea of these cores that are just waiting for work. So to actually utilize them well, you actually need to throw, you know, hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of threads at them, depending on the problem. And so the, the, the key parallel abstractions behind CUDA is that basically you have uh, a hierarchy of these threads, and pr we provide very lightweight synchronization primitives for uh, synchronizing between the threads. And then finally, we, we add a, a special shared memory space, which allows groups of these threads to cooperate and, and talk to one another. So we can actually visualize what uh, this kind of hierarchy or, or grid actually looks like. So on, on the top here, we've got this little squiggly line that we're using to, de to denote a, a single CUDA thread. Uh, and so basically the idea here is that each of these threads are going to execute the same program. So you're going to code up a little function and assume that all of these threads are going to execute that function in parallel at once. Then we're going to take those threads and group them into what we call thread blocks. Um, 
So basically, the reason that we do this is to allow uh, a group of threads to coordinate or talk to each other or communicate in some way. Um, it turns out there are uh, particular problems uh, have much better solutions if you assume that you know, a group of threads are able to talk to each other. And then we can you know, identify uh, threads and blocks with a, a unique uh, ID. So if we go back to that, the mini core uh, straw man diagram I had from before, uh, the idea here is that CUDA is going to take this hardware that actually physically exists in your CPU, and then it's going to basically virtualize it. So it's going to present to the programmer or pretend like you have more resources than are actually present in the, uh, the actual GPU or the, the physical machine. And the reason that we might do this is because it allows the scalability to, to future uh, architectures. And so what you should not think of this, you should not think of this model as uh, what, we call, what we might call a flat uh, multiprocessor. So in fact, uh, it's not as though all the threads are operating uh, together concurrently at the same time in a, in a synchronous manner. Uh, that, you know, some people might assume this uh, in, a, in models such as, you know, PRAM uh, for, for analyzing uh, the theoretical bounds of uh, algorithms, but you shouldn't think of uh, a CUDA program that way. And nor should you think of a CUDA program as though you're approaching a, uh, a distributed processor uh, cluster. So, for example, uh, APIs such as MPI for programming things like uh, big clusters might assume that uh, the, the processors can, can sort of talk to each other very easily uh, through an interconnection network, and that's not actually the uh, model that, that CUDA provides. So, in fact, CUDA is more of a heterogeneous uh, computing uh, uh, architecture or idea. So, basically, CUDA is going to assume the existence of some sort of serial uh, processor, in, in most cases a CPU, and it's going to assume the existence of the parallel or many-core GPU, and it's going to allow these two to cooperate uh, on the same problem. And we call it heterogeneous because parts of your, pro your problem are going to be serial, and parts are going to be uh, parallel. And it's up to the programmer to basically identify those parts and map them onto the, the resources at hand. So up on the slide here is basically a fairly complete set of you know, the additions to the C language that CUDA provides. And so actually the, the philosophy here is to provide this really minimal set of extensions that are actually necessary to expose the parallelism in your problem. So for example, we introduced uh, function qualifiers that you can decorate functions with. For example, global, that basically tells the compiler that this function is going to execute on the GPU. Uh, and device provides a, a similar function. We've also got uh, keywords such as variable qualifiers, which denote where uh, a variable, which memory space a variable should live in. And then finally, say we've, we've written a, a global function called myKernel. We need a way to actually tell the, the program to to launch that kernel or to make it run on the, the GPU. Um, we've also introduced some uh, extensions for configuring how the launch should happen, um, which you see in the, the, the fourth bullet there. And then finally, uh, there are some built-in variables that you can use to identify uh, uh, each thread within uh, you know, the, the problem at hand. And so I guess the, the idea here is to just give you a taste of uh, what the, the CUDA extensions look like and to sort of demonstrate it's actually pretty minimal. Um, if you can program in C, you can program in CUDA. Uh, the, the, the hard part or the challenging part is actually to figure out how to map your program and decompose it into a way that's, uh, that's uh, parallel at a large scale. So it looks like I have uh, about 10 minutes left. Let's look at a really short Hello World program. So say we want to do vector addition in parallel. We just want to take two huge vectors, add them together, and then write them back out to memory. Well, what we might do to implement this is start with uh, the actual computational kernel. Or in CUDA, we call that the global function. So we write this function, call it vector add, then we decorate it with the little uh, global keyword. So what vector add is going to do is going to take in three arrays, or three pointers to arrays, uh, A, B, and C. The actual body of the function is very simple. Uh, each thread, when this uh, function gets executed, is going to com compute this index i. It's basically going to identify which thread is being executed and which element in the arrays needs to be worked on. And after that, it's just like C. 
we uh, you know, do some pointer arithmetic, do some uh, floating point arithmetic, and then write out to, to this uh, C array. And so that's actually uh, the device code uh, that we call it. Then we can also take a look at uh, what we call the host code. This is, this is actually the code that's going to execute on the CPU. And it looks just like C, right? You, you write a, a, a main function. Uh, there's some fairly lengthy initialization code that has to, to, has to happen, which I've omitted here. And then to actually make the uh, parallel kernel execute, or to launch it, uh, you know, we use this funky uh, triple chevron syntax with the, uh, the, the carrots there. Basically, what we need to do here is to divide the problem into uh, thread blocks. So say we have n elements in our arrays. Um, one, way, one thing we could do is say, OK, create uh, groups of threads that are 256 threads uh, large, and then uh, launch you know, n over 256 uh, blocks of those, and then just pass the function its arguments. And so the actual initialization code that uh, I left out of the slide involves some um, basically allocating the memory that the, uh, the kernel is going to execute on. So another way, in that, uh, another way that, that CUDA is this heterogeneous uh, idea is that not only is the computation heterogeneous, you need to partition the code into portions that execute on the CPU and portions that execute on the GPU. You also need to partition the memory space into memory that the CPU can see and memory that the GPU has access to. And you do that in sort of the normal way using uh, you know, uh, functions from C called malloc. Uh, but for uh, you know, CUDA introduces uh, some extensions. Uh, instead of malloc, we use something called CUDA malloc to, to allocate uh, uh, memory that the GPU can have access to. Uh, yeah? So that's a good question. The, the question was, where did I get this number 256? I basically pulled it you know, arbitrarily out of a hat. Um, so that's actually uh, an important performance concern. The, uh, the, the decision of how many uh, threads to put into a block uh, may actually affect performance. Um, and it depends on the actual problem that you're uh, actually working on. We'll, we'll talk later in the class about how to basically tune the kernel uh, to, get, to achieve optimal uh, performance. And one way to tune is to choose that number carefully. Uh, if you don't really care, if you just want to get up and running, it, you know, uh, 256 is a, is a good number as a, as a rule of thumb. Then after, you got a question. I'm just really curious, how does the, the kernel know not to go at the n plus one element? So that's a good question. The question was, how does the kernel know not to uh, work on the n you know, how, how does the kernel know how to stay in bounds? So the kernel actually doesn't know. Um, that's up to the programmer. And I've been sloppy in this example and not checked. Um, if you actually look on the, uh, the, the website, we've got a robust version that does all the necessary uh, uh, you know, arithmetic that'll, that'll make sure that we don't uh, access any uh, memory that's out of bounds. And in fact, it'll, it'll, the program will crash just like it will on the, the CPU um, with you know, the normal point, pointer rules. So that's just a, a fairly quick example of a, of a CUDA program. Um, just got a few minutes left. So I want to give you some examples of some uh, projects that uh, students have worked on in, in past instances of this course. Um, basically, the, the, the thing to look at uh, here is the, um, basically the, the lines of, of source code that the total program consumes. So for example, one of these applications was a video uh, decode, I guess, so H.264. So the, the total source code for the entire application was uh, maybe 35,000 lines. And so what the students did was identify a portion of that source code that could be parallelized on the GPU. And it turned out that that parallel kernel only, only took a, you know, 200 lines to code up. And what, what they also um, realize is that the actual computational kernel of the ap application was taking 35% of the total application time. And so depending on the, the, the total percent time that the, the, comp you know, the, the kernel of computation of the application requires, this is going to determine how much, of, how much speed up you're going to actually enjoy on, on the GPU. 
So in fact, what you're going to want to do is look for problems that have 99% of its time, that spend 99% of its time in, in a densely uh, comp uh, computational kernel. And so, you know, depending, depending on how parallel the problem is, you see different uh, speed ups for different applications. So, for example, for that, um, for that video decode, that was actually kind of a poor example because, uh, you know, the speed up of the, 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 the kernel of the computation uh, was probably 20 times. But since the kernel only took 35% of the total application time, the speed up of the entire application was, was much smaller. So what you really want to do is look for problems that are sort of inherently parallel and spend most of their time doing computation. And some examples of those problems uh, are what you see uh, with these speed ups for applications that get anywhere from, you know, 79 times speed up to, to, to 400 uh, and change speed up. So basically, um, you know, look, look at your problem carefully. Uh, look for problems that are inherently parallel and uh, have kernels that you can uh, identify uh, fairly easily. So um, just some final thoughts I want you to take away from this introduction is that, uh, you know, we at NVIDIA think that parallel hardware is probably here to stay. Um, in fact, other vendors uh, agree with us. Uh, you're really not seeing uh, serial programmers uh, in, in mass markets uh, anymore. Um, GPUs are, you should think of GPUs as massively parallel many core processors. Um, and they're easily available and they're fully programmable. Um, you can easily find them in laptops uh, today and you know, begin co uh, co coding in CUDA today. Um, parallelism and scalability of the problem is, is crucial to, to succeed and achieve the, the speed ups that uh, we saw on the, the previous slide. And uh, you know, we think that this, this new march towards parallelism is, is uh, imposing these many important uh, research and ed educational challenges. Uh, so to wrap up, I want to assign uh, machine problem zero. So this isn't for credit. Um, you can go on the, uh, the website, the, the, the course site, uh, right now and find this tutorial. It'll basically take you step by step uh, of writing very, some very simple uh, CUDA programs. Uh, and will really hold your hand uh, along the way. And just, you know, work through the tutorial codes. It shouldn't take that, uh, that much long. And uh, I guess next time uh, we'll hear from David and he'll talk about uh, programming CUDA in a little bit more depth. All right. See you next time. Thanks. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.